subject is the Gospels and Acts. And tonight we're doing 2.2, that is important events in the life of Christ. Important events in the life of Christ. Uh, we are busy with the book of Matthew, the first synoptic gospel. The objective tonight is to introduce the ministry of John the Baptist and to explore some of the major events in Jesus' life. So John the Baptist, who knows anything about John the Baptist? So John was the one who was preparing the way of the Messiah. Okay. We know enough about him to know the following. His birth was meticulously recorded in Luke chapter 1 verse 5 to 25. You can study his birth. You will see that it was a miraculous birth also marked by angelic proclamation and divine intervention. What we mean there is that John's mother was not able to have children. So, uh, similar to Abram and Sarah waiting for Isaac, John's parents, there's a similarity there. His formative years was lived in obscurity in the desert. His public ministry ended 400 years of prophetic silence. John was the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the coming Messiah. You can see that in Isaiah 43, and you can also see the references of Matthew 3, 3 Mark 1, uh, verse 2 to 3, and then Luke 3, verse 3 to 6. What we must also understand that in a sense, his message and his ministry mark the culmination of the law and the prophets but heralded the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. So it's this end of a dispensation. As somebody said tonight, the central theme of his ministry was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was called the Baptist because his practice was to baptize those who responded to the message he proclaimed and sincerely repented of their sins. Jesus once asked, what did you go out to see in the desert? Now, according to my studies, it was a four-day walk that these guys walked out to go and see John. So they walked far to, to go out to John. And it was just John there in camel hair, eating locust and preaching. And he also didn't mince words. He was prophetic and you will see in Matthew 3 10 that he talks about the axe that's laid at the roots he talks about the purging of the threshing floor and he, he talks about the repentance that's necessary he's warning the people and yet these Pharisees Sadducees scribes they're all going out to see John where Jesus for instance went to the people the people came to John and John was this final prophet under the prophetic dispensation that preached about the Messiah. And then he was also the prophet that identified the Messiah. You remember when he saw Jesus, what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He identified Jesus. And yet if you really study his life, you will see that his lifestyle was austere and as austere as his message, which means this man lived in the wilderness. He was clothed in camel hair. Uh, uh, he was eating locusts and, uh, and honey. He sacrificed his entire life for the call that he felt upon his life. He also said, I'm not the Messiah. He says that one greater than I am is coming. I'm not even fit to tie his shoelaces. So he knew what his place was. And unlike Jesus, he expected people to come to him rather than he going to them. John was no crowd pleaser. He was willing to confront hypocrisy and the religious establishments. 
He didn't hesitate to expose the immorality of Herod. And he rather chose a martyr's death than to compromise his convictions. But we know that even John, at some stage, sent his disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you the Messiah or should we expect somebody else? Although he knew it, his situation that he was in caused him to ask that question. For us, that's quite a lesson. We can learn something from that. I mean, if you go study the baptism of Jesus, which is one of the events that we look at, John was there. And John didn't want to baptize Jesus. But when he baptized Jesus, the Holy Spirit came like a dove upon Jesus. And then the Father spoke and said, This is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. John heard this. He saw this. He identified him as the Lamb of God. And yet when he was arrested and sitting in prison, it's almost like he started doubting. And he sent his disciples to Jesus and he said, are you the Messiah or should we expect somebody else? For us, it's such a great lesson because we can see human nature there. Aren't there times in your life when you get to that point where you are asking Jesus the same question? Where things are not happening as you thought they should happen and you are entertaining what I like to call the seed of disappointment where you allow disappointment to come inside of you, you think disappointing thoughts, you start sometimes murmuring, and then you start questioning God. And this actually nicely f runs straight into the temptation of Christ, as we're going to talk about that tonight as well, because we will see that the enemy is always trying to confuse us. He's always trying to confuse us, He's got these weapons, confusion, deception, discouragement. If he can get you to become discouraged, if he can get you to become confused, then he can hone in on you and he can whisper little things in your ear and then he wants to use your mouth to start proclaiming certain things and saying certain, certain things. Remember when we did OTS 1, what did we see was the great problem in the nation of Israel? What was the biggest problem in the nation of Israel? Can you remember? What would be murmuring? So murmuring is also complaining, where you complain about your current situation. Some of us call that praying. <laughs> but it's not praying. It's actually murmuring. Murmuring is when you say things like, I don't understand. Because when you say, I don't understand, God, I don't understand what you're doing. It is actually showing a lack of faith <laughs> in the divine plan that God has for your life. And God can use anything. And in fact, the scripture promises that God will use everything for his glory. And he will turn around everything. When we ask those type of questions, we are actually empowering satanic forces in our lives. Because we are starting to complain and moan against God about our lives. If we really trust the Lord, it's easy to say I have faith and I trust the Lord, but if we really trust the Lord in the most difficult seasons of our lives, we will sometimes just be silent, sometimes we will worship, but we will know that it's going to work out for the good. We will have a positive expectation. But when life happens to us, like it happened to John, John was arrested. And we all know that John was beheaded. So he was arrested and basically waiting trial or execution. He didn't know what was going to happen to him, but he was arrested. When we get into those situations, we could 
sometimes lose our faith in a sense where we start saying, oh, why am I here? What am I doing here? How did this happen? And all of that. And we must be very careful because if we can then stand upon God's word and upon his promises, and if we can believe God in spite of what we're seeing with our eyes, because what you see with your eyes is always going to be the opposite. It was on the edge of the promised land that the spies went in and they saw the promised land with all the nice things in the promised land, but then they noticed these giants. And these giants to them was overwhelming. So they thought, we can't do that. And then they confessed that. They confessed that they saw the giants there and they looked like grasshoppers in their own eyes and in the giant's eyes. They didn't confess what God had promised them. The Lord says, go and spy out the land that I've promised, it's yours. They see the giants. When you see the adversity and the opposite circumstances, you have a choice. You're going to either remain in faith or you're going to move into fear. But you have that choice at that moment. John was the greatest prophet. Jesus said he was the greatest prophet that ever lived. Why? Because he was the final prophet. He was the prophet that not only prophesied about Messiah, like all the major and the minor prophets, they prophesied about Messiah. John was the prophet who actually identified Messiah. When Messiah came, he saw Jesus and he said, there's the Lamb of God. The one that all these prophets have been prophesying about for thousands of years, there's he. And he proclaimed his coming. He prepared the way, like the prophets declared he would. But when John was arrested, he asked Jesus that question, should we expect somebody else? It's a, also a great lesson for us that if John the Baptist, who committed his whole life to ministry, who lived out in the desert, who did not worry about the things of this world, but who committed himself 100% to ministry, if he could have gotten to a position where he lost faith or he started doubting, we have to understand that we are very susceptible to discouragement and doubt as human beings. So that's why the Apostle Paul says that we have to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. A lot of times the church thinks that faith is just going to be there. That you are always going to be solid in your belief system. That you are always going to be solid in the way you serve the Lord. And that it's just going to happen naturally. They don't understand that there's a definite process that we have to follow as Christians to build ourselves up in our most holy faith and to maintain that standard of faith, especially when the difficult seasons come in our life. Because there are seasons in our life that are difficult. And here we've got Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. And also you can study it in Mark 1, 9 to 11, Luke 3, 21 to 22, and John 1, 32 to 34. We've got Jesus... And Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to fulfill all righteous requirements. Then John consented. What did Jesus mean? When he said this, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteous requirements. To set an example for us reading the Gospels now to see what the pattern is that we should follow. So why is baptism then important? Is it a religious act? Something that you do because it's you being religious? Or what is baptism? So the process is that you receive Jesus. You confess with your mouth 
you believe with your heart according to Scripture, and you receive Him as Lord and Savior, confessing that you believe that He died on the cross for your sins as the final sacrifice, and that He rose again from the dead, and you surrender your life to Him, then, as a public declaration in obedience, you follow Jesus to the baptismal waters where you go under the water symbolizing the laying off of the old man and then when you stand up out of the water it's the symbol of your resurrection in Christ which means you are now a new creation the old has gone away the new has come so it's a public declaration to those around you and also to the powers and the principalities of the air that's observing that you have now publicly acknowledged that you are laying down your old life and taking up your new life in Christ. We will talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, maybe some more in later lectures, but then you have the opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit in faith. If you go look at the book of Acts, you will see that the Holy Spirit was given with the laying on of hands. And the person who receives the Spirit, receives it in faith. There's this place in the book of Acts where they come and they say, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, no. Uh, and then they say, with what baptism were you baptized? And then they say, we were baptized with John's baptism, meaning a baptism of repentance, a water baptism. And then they are prayed for and they receive the Holy Spirit. Now question yeah. if we look at the next verse, in verse 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove, alighting on him. A voice from heaven said, this is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. So, there's a clear picture here for us. Jesus, who's Jesus' father? How did Jesus' mother become pregnant? The Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and she became pregnant. So Jesus was birthed by the Holy Spirit. But yet, as he's preparing for his public ministry, he's going through the baptismal waters to fulfill righteous requirements, to set this example. This is something that we probably won't understand fully now because it's a spiritual thing here. When you get baptized and you make that decision, something happens spiritually. We don't know exactly what, but there's something spiritual about this. This is why it's in the Bible. And it's mentioned in, in all the Gospels. So it's important. It's not something you just skip. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon him. So we've got the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So say, for instance, you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you have the Holy Spirit, you've got the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But then you've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit which the early church called the second blessing. Some called it the enablement. Because remember what Jesus said. His disciples were functioning. He blew upon them in the Gospels. They went out, they healed the sick, they did all sorts of things. But He still told them, tarry in Jerusalem until you are endured with power from on high. So He said, wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. In another place he says, because when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the enablement for ministry, for ministry capacity. And if you look at this timing in Jesus' life, there's no miracles recorded in Jesus' life up until this point. He gets baptized. The Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit now leads him into the desert. 
to be tempted. It's similar to our lives. There's this process of testing that we have to go through. And you'll see after the testing, the public ministry starts. There's also something else you have to note here, and that is that the Father spoke at Jesus' inauguration. You can call it His inauguration. His release into public ministry. The Father spoke and approved. Let's talk about the temptation of Jesus quickly. Can you remember how Jesus was tempted? The first temptation was the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written. It is written. It is written is the three first words Jesus speaks in the Synoptic Gospels. His first three words, it is written. In that is a key for us as far as temptation is concerned. We have to understand that when it comes to temptation, it is written. We have to use the sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? In Ephesians, when we talk about the armor of God, what is the sword of the Spirit? It's the Word of God. And that is what we use as a sword. He says, It is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. As I said, the first three recorded words in the Synoptic Gospel that Jesus spoke, Matthew 4, 4, it is written. So we could say that the first temptation deals with the lust of the flesh. Being hungry, Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, praying, fasting, spending time with His Father. He was hungry. We also see a similar thing happen with the first Adam. Remember what the Bible says. The first Adam was a living being and the second Adam was a? life-giving spirit. So we have the first Adam falling for the sin of the lust of the flesh. The fruit in the garden looked good. And that Adam said, let me place my desires above God's word. Let me place what I want above God's word. The second Adam said, it is written. So the second Adam demonstrates to us that we have to place God's word above our own desires. There's a lot more you can say about the first temptation. You can read about it in your notes, but that's what I want to say tonight about it. Then the second temptation... Now the second temptation occurred when the devil tempted Jesus to leap from the highest point of the temple of Solomon. If you are the Son of God, note that he's always attacking first Jesus' identity. Who are you? Who are you? Tonight, as you're sitting here or whenever you're watching online, who are you? If you are. Who are you? A lot of the problems that you are facing, a lot of the anger that you have, a lot of the frustration that you have, a lot of the elevated responses of the, or the overreaction is because of your lack of identity. Because of the fact that you feel you have to prove yourself, that you feel you have to prove yourself or you have to not allow people to step on you, you have to dominate. And a lot of the problems in your life comes because of this lack of identity. So he says, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give His angels command concerning you. They will lift you up on their hands, and you will, your foot will not strike a stone. 
Here Satan was quoting scripture once again. He knows his Bible very well and he loves to beat up believers by bringing scriptures to their minds that condemn them or cause them to be fearful. Jesus is soon going to claim that he is God in the human flesh. How is anyone going to believe his claim? Satan suggested that he used his supernatural power to prove that claim. But Jesus answered Satan, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You see, we can say that the second temptation also deals with what is called the pride of life. And again, like I said, it is about proving yourself. About not wanting to allow people to step on you or what our curriculum suggests is that this could have been a shortcut for Jesus because here Jesus jumps off the highest point of the temple and the angels come and they let him down in front of all the people. And all the people see his supernatural power. So that guy just flew from the highest point of the temple and everybody acknowledges him. Everybody saw him. And then everybody accepts him. So a lot of times we are tempted with the lust of the flesh or the pride of life. And then the third temptation, Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this will I give to you, Satan says, if you fall down and worship me. But Jesus responded, away from me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Now you could say that this third temptation, you could call this uh, the lust of the eyes, where also the devil says, listen, I will give you everything if you serve me. And a lot of times in our lives, that same offer comes to us when we are prompted by the enemy to compromise. I mean, have you ever been in a situation where the enemy has said to you, listen, if you compromise now, I will give you certain things. You can have a short-term gain by breaking God's word or by transgressing God's word, by stealing or by being dishonest or by doing something else. And for us as well, with the world we're living in constantly, we are exposed to this kind of temptation where the enemy is placing stuff in front of us, trying to get us to take that bait. I mean, why is the devil tempting us? Why do you think he tempts us? To test our faith, yes? See if we really believe? What did Jesus say to Peter? He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brethren. So there's a sifting that takes place of our faith when we are tested. That is true. The devil is also fearful of the calling upon your life of the divine purpose that God has for you in your life, your kingdom mandate, something that you have to do in the kingdom. The devil fears that. And if he can get you to bow before him and to run after finances or make decisions based on what he offers, then you lose your kingdom mandate. You lose your kingdom influence. You lose your divine purpose because you have made a decision based on what the enemy has offered you. And I remember when I was a young man, I had a, I had a job offer. And I knew this job offer was paying, you know, 10 times more than what I was earning currently. But I knew that this job would remove me from ministry totally. So I, I had to make that decision back then. 
Was I going to take the money and take the better job? Or was I going to remain in the lower paying job and continue in ministry and trust God? A lot of times those decisions come and there is a temptation for us when that happens. So the one thing that the temptation of Jesus also teaches us, if we ask ourselves what is the significance of the temptation of Jesus, the one thing is that Jesus Christ overcame the enemy. He didn't fall for any of the temptations. And we also know now today that it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. So when we're facing temptation, we need to be Christ inside minded. We need to understand that the greater one is inside of us and that he will sustain us. He says and he promises in the word that we will never be tempted above our ability and with every temptation he will also give us the outcome. And he says, when we are tempted, we should never say that God is tempting us. But we are tempted by our own desires and our own lusts. When we are pulled into the temptation. And the enemy is throwing that in front of us. But then we understand that when we are there and we're facing it, that the greater one is living within us. So greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation. In this world you will have trouble. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So he's the conqueror and we are more than conquerors. So when we think of Jesus Christ inside of us and we, and we look at these temptations, we also understand that the greater one is inside of us. And that we, when we're facing temptations, we should respond in the same way that Jesus responded. How did Jesus respond? How did he respond to the temptations? To every temptation, how did he respond? With? He responded with the Word. He responded with the Word. So if you know the word, if you understand the word, if you have a revelation of the word, then the Holy Spirit quickens that word when you are facing temptation. He quickens that in your heart. And all of a sudden, you understand, this is what I should do. This is how I should respond. Temptation, yeah, as we look at it, and we said we were looking at the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. Those are great temptations that we face. But there's also more temptations that we face. A lot of those temptations have to do with our circumstances and what we see with our eyes. That is why the Bible says that we now have to walk by faith and not by sight. Because we are tempted to walk by sight and not by faith. And when things go wrong, we then have to respond with God's word. Because the temptation is to become feeble and to have feeble knees. But we must strengthen those feeble knees so that we can stand on God's word in every single situation, everything that we face. Another essence that we have to understand is that the essence of the temptations and the responses of Jesus is God first. But this time in Matthew 4.10 we also see God first. Yes, we have to prioritize God and then also we have to say Him only. You must only serve God. It must only be God. He must be at the center. He must be first. And he must be the only God that you serve, no other gods. 